I am not by any means an expert on poetry, but I have been moved by it. There's a poem entitled The Palace that I just love. Kipling is talking about a king who's nearing the end of his life. And he's saying, I tried to build a palace. And now I see only ruins. My objectives were clear. My performance was less than perfect. But I pass on to my successor the dream of the palace I tried to build. It was hard as hell for a student to get a summer job. So my father, through some contacts he had, got me a job as a sailor on the dollar line ship, the President Hoover. And I was in Shanghai at the time the Japanese bombed it. As a matter of fact, our ship was bombed. Obviously, we thought it was bombed by the Japanese. It turned out later we'd been mistaken by the Chinese for a Japanese ship. Stupidly, I was on deck watching the planes bomb us, totally unprotected. It was an absurd judgment. That was toward the beginning of the Chinese-Japanese War. And I didn't know what had gone before that brought the Japanese to that point. And I didn't realize the degree to which that was a step toward Pearl Harbor. I had no understanding of the geopolitics of that area. These events were all a part of a sequence of actions. It's a sequence. And I didn't understand it. One of the greatest lessons I had was from General Wolfe, who was commander of the 58th Bomb Wing during World War II. I was the statistical control officer. I didn't have enough paper. We didn't have enough paper in those days to write reports. And he had a pad of paper on his desk. And I put this folder down on the pad of paper. And then I said to him, General, what we're doing is insane. We're sending lubricating oil to the forward bases in China when we should be sending aircraft fuel. We don't have enough fuel up there to carry the missions. And we're sending lubricating oil. And it's stupid. Well, he said, Bob, you, you, you send the message. I said, hell, that's not my job, General. He said, hell, you send that message. But I say, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you are wrong. We all make mistakes. But by God, if you're not willing to make a mistake, you're not going to make progress in life. You go ahead and send the message. So I picked up my manila folder, and as I picked it up, my fingers went under, and I picked up the pad with it. He said, I saw what you're doing. You're stealing my pad of paper. <laughs> I said, you caught me, General. I need it. I don't have any paper. He said, go ahead and take it. And that reminds me of a story. I don't know whether you want to use it, but it's funny as hell. The, uh, I was a, a, a lieutenant colonel, and LeMay's, uh, one, his chief operations officer was a colonel that I'd served with in India and China. We shared a desk that was about that long and about this wide. And the reason was LeMay's whole headquarters was in one Quonset hut. A friend of mine invited me over for dinner. And we passed these tremendous naval supply areas. There was, I'm not exaggerating, there was an acre of Quonset huts. We got into the officers club and there was the longest bar I've ever seen. We had drinks and steak and my God, I had had nothing like that for since I'd been on the Mar in the Marianas. And while we were eating, two friends of my naval officer friend came up, and they looked at me and they said, you know, there's nothing good about the Air Force except your khakis. You've got the best damn khakis in the world. I said, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you two sets of khakis for two Quonset huts. Deliver them to LeMay's headquarters. And I, I increased the, 
size of LeMay's headquarters by 100% for two pairs of khakis. That doesn't have a damn thing to do with the war. <laughs> that was the nature of what was going on. President Kennedy, in the, I think it was the first month of his administration, asked all of the members of the National Security Council to read Barbara Tuckman's Guns of August because in that book she recounts a story of two German chancellors at the end of World War I. I've forgotten how many millions and millions of Germans were killed. One says to the other, how did it happen? And the other says, I wish I knew. And Kennedy said, that's not going to happen to us. We had a panel discussion in Moscow examining the events of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And an old man got up, he had a scraggly beard, and in Russian, he said, I'm Commander X. We had four submarines. Each submarine carried 10 torpedoes, and one torpedo of each submarine had a nuclear warhead. Those guys were out of communication with Moscow, and they didn't know that in effect, the Cuban Missile Crisis was over for several days after it ended, and they were floating around under the water with that nuclear-tipped torpedo ready to shoot. Now, this, this sounds insane, but it was. Yeah, I hope there aren't some still down there. I too. When I came to Ford Motor Company, they had never had a certified financial statement. Never in the history of the company. Henry Ford said, who are all those people over there on the other side of the glass? And they said, well, that's the accounting department. He said, why do we need an accounting department? Don't we have a bank statement? They said, of course. That's enough. Get rid of them. To determine the liabilities, the accounts payable, they weighed the invoices. So many dollars of payments per pound. In the first eight months we were there, I think we lost 50 odd million dollars cash. When they wanted to fire a production executive, they wouldn't tell him he was fired. In the weekend, they'd go in and chop up his furniture. So on Monday, he'd come in, he'd find his office all chopped up. He knew he was fired. It was really insane. The differences between Johnson and me were so great that we couldn't continue. And at one point he said, Bob, you can have any job you want that's at my disposal, anything in the world. And I said, well, George Woods, who was then president of the World Bank, suggested that I should move to the World Bank. Johnson says, OK, if you want the World Bank job, it's yours. Well, I said, Mr. President, it can't be mine because it has to be elected. He said, look, I am president of the U.S. I will nominate it and I'll damn well see that, that you'll get it. The secretary of the Treasury said, well, Mr. President, you have to name three people. Johnson says, OK. I'll do it. Three. McNamara, McNamara, McNamara. <laughs> Typical Johnson. <laughs> we arrived in Ouagadougou, met with the uh, leaders, the president, prime minister, all the ministers. They said, we don't want you here unless you're going to take care of our problem of onchocerciasis. I said, hell, I can't spell it. I never heard of it. What is it? It's a disease that is spread by the black fly which bites individuals and deposits larvae under their skin, and the larvae develop into worms. A fly may bite one person a thousand times in a day. These larvae have two effects. One causes itching so serious that people commit suicide. The other causes blindness. There were children holding, I'll call it broomsticks, on one end, at the other end, was an adult, blind. So for the rest of his life, he's led around by a child. The way to handle this is to apply a pesticide to the river and prevent the fly from being born. In December of 2001, the World Bank held a celebration of the end of river blindness. It has been a tremendous success. It has 
prevented 600,000 cases of blindness, innumerable suicides, and, and it has brought back 55 million arable acres. It's illustrative of what can be done if human beings will seize the opportunity. I was walking through these demonstrators, thousands of them. Nobody recognized me. Uh, these were young people. I was on the world stage two or three or four decades ago. One young girl recognized me and said, I'm sure you will agree that the World Bank has failed. Young lady, you're out of your mind. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. How do you measure quality of life? Life expectancy. Reduction in infant mortality, improvement in nutrition, better housing, employment. Now, in all of those terms, the world is far better off today. You don't try to tell me about this. I was president of the World Bank for 13 years. You don't seem to understand, young lady, that where you're standing, the capital of the richest country in the world, Washington, D.C., our infant mortality is twice that of Castro's Cuba. Now, why the hell aren't you demonstrating about that? Whose responsibility is that? Is that the World Bank's responsibility? You, your parents, your friends, I, we're responsible. I hope you've learned a lesson, young lady. The presidential campaign was fought in part on the issue of the missile gap. John F. Kennedy alleged the U.S. had an inferior strategic nuclear capability confronting the Soviet Union. I felt that one of my first obligations as Secretary of Defense was to determine the size of the missile gap and what should be done to overcome it. And what we learned was there wasn't any missile gap, or if there was, it was in our favor. Now, just about that time, my Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs said, Bob, you haven't met the Pentagon press. God damn it, Arthur, I don't know anything about the press. I'm president of an automobile company. You've got to help me here. Protect me. Say, no, no, you got to meet them. So we met them, probably 50 members of the press. First question was, Mr. Secretary, as you know, the uh, campaign was fought, among other things, on the issue of the missile gap. Tell us, what have you learned about it? Well, I said, we determined there wasn't a missile gap. If there is, it's in our favor. You couldn't hold the doors. The headlines that afternoon, McNamara says no missile gap. Dirksen, Republican majority leader, said called for Kennedy's resignation. He had won the election on a false charge. All hell broke loose. I went to see the president the next morning. I said, God almighty, Mr. President, I came down here to help you, and all I've done is <laughs> generate calls for your resignation. I said, I, I resign today. Oh, hell, he said, Bob, look, you put your foot in your mouth, don't worry about it. Uh, we all do it, forget it. Working with, with Jack Kennedy was a joy. He's very bright, quite witty, self-deprecating, and he had a sense of humor. And Bobby was a delight to work with. And I should say one thing more, because it, I, when I mentioned Bobby, I thought of Ted. You know, those three individuals grew tremendously. My God, I'll never forget the first meeting I was in after I become secretary with Bobby. He got up to speak. I, I could have gotten under the chair. It was so amateurish. I was embarrassed. Later, the speech he made on the night Martin Luther King was killed. It was in Indiana. He was campaigning there. It was totally impromptu. He got up on the flatbed of a truck. At night, he delivered the most marvelous speech you can possibly imagine. That's the way he grew. Jack Kennedy grew the same way. Jackie gave me a, a movie of Jack Kennedy speaking in the mid-1950s. I've never shown it to my children. I'm so embarrassed by it. I've heard expressed that if John Kennedy had lived, the war in Vietnam would never have occurred not on this level. Well, you know, it's, it's speculation to say that. But what I am certain of is this. Approximately six weeks before he died, the specific date was October 2nd, 1963. I had returned from Vietnam that morning. At that time, we had 16,000 military advisors. I recommended to President Kennedy and to the Security Council that 
we establish a plan and an objective of removing all of them within two years, that is to say by December 31, 1965, and we take the first step by removing a thousand within the next 90 days by December 31, 1963. That was a very, very controversial uh, uh, recommendation. The, the Security Council was split on it. We argued back and forth. Finally, the president accepted it. But I was wise enough by that time in the ways of Washington to know that those who lose one day live to fight another day. And I thought, how the hell am I going to cement this? And I thought the way to cement this is to have it publicly announced. There are going to be happier times ahead in hundreds of homes across the United States as fathers and sons and husbands return home from the Vietnamese battleground in time for Christmas. This is the first contingent of the thousand servicemen who are being withdrawn from the jungle war against the Viet Cong communists. This is in line with the decision of the United States to reduce our forces there to 15,000 men. They care not about high-level decisions. Their theme song is a happy one. Kennedy announced we were going to pull out all of our military advisors by the end of 65, we're going to take a thousand out at the end of 63, and we did. But there was a coup in South Vietnam. Diem was overthrown, and he and his brother were killed. I was present with the president when together we received information of that coup. I have never seen him more upset. He totally blanched. President Kennedy and I had tremendous problems with ZM, but my God, he was the authority. He was the head of state, and he was overthrown by a military coup. And Kennedy knew, and I knew, that to some degree, the U.S. government was responsible for that. you to dictate to me a uh, memorandum a couple of pages, uh, four-letter words and short sentences on uh, the situation in Vietnam, the Vietnam picture. I've got to have some kind of a summarized, logical, factual analysis. Something in my own words I can say, well, here are the alternatives. Now, why did you say you sent a thousand home? I'd put a center saying that because uh, uh, they'd complete their mission. Why did McMurray say they're coming back in 65? Because uh, when you say you're going to give a man a high school education, he's in the tenth grade, and you've got two years to do it, you can train him in two years. And that doesn't mean that everybody comes back. But that means your training ought to be in pretty good shape at that time. That's what's said, not anything inconsistent. children can live are to go into the dark. We 
must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. The Strategic Air Command had PSYOPs, Strategic Integrated Operation Plans. They had five. One, two, three, four were retaliatory plans. Second strike. In the event that there are 350 or whatever were launched against us, we would launch our 5,500 against those targets. The Strategic Air Command also had a first strike plan called 1A. I went out to, to Omaha to the Strategic Air Command headquarters to learn this and, and early, I didn't know a, a nuclear weapon from an automobile in, in January 61 and I went through every one of those war plans. President Eisenhower had appointed four four-star officers to consider exactly what I'm talking about. It was only one copy of that study, none in the Defense Department. I got a copy of it, I read it. We would have been, I won't say destroyed, but it depends how you define destroyed. I define destroyed as losing a few tens of millions of people and a lot of our industry and chaos in our communications and medical system and body politic. No responsible president would, then or today, initiate a first strike. It's militarily unnecessary, morally repugnant, and politically indefensible. I can't conceive of our ever doing it. And yet that is our policy today. That is NATO's stated policy. First strike when necessary. One of the lessons of Vietnam, among others, and there are many, many lessons, but one of the lessons of the war is, for God's sakes, communicate with your, your enemy. There was no high-level communication between uh, Washington and Hanoi. And there was total misunderstanding as a result. We could have communicated. As a matter of fact, we came very close to it. There was a group known as Pugwash. This group brought together scientists from both communist countries and Western countries. And it was meeting in, in Paris. Henry Kissinger was asked to attend by two men. One, his name was Obrick, and the other was named with Markovich. And Obrick was pretty sure he could get into, into Hanoi. If the U.S. had any message to send to Ho Chi Minh, they would be prepared to take it. So I probed a little bit. I found out that Ho Chi Minh was the godfather of Obrick's child. And so we prepared a message we thought was a step forward. We got it to Kissinger to give to Obrick, and Obrick and Barkovich went to Phnom Penh to get a visa. And while they were there, we bombed Hanoi. These things were compartmentalized. The military had, let's say, an authorization for, whatever, a week or two weeks of bombing to be done when the weather was right. So that was in one compartment, and the negotiation with Henry and I were in another. And uh, the fact is that Ho Chi Minh was being bombed at a time when we were trying to send a message that we wanted to communicate. We got that close, and it collapsed. On this occasion, what would you have said to Ho Chi Minh? We hadn't really worked it out. The hotline was installed after the Cuban Missile Crisis to try to prevent uh, misunderstandings similar to that in the future. The first time it was ever used was in connection with the June 67 war in the Middle East, Israel and Egypt. And uh, Egypt was determined to wipe Israel off the face of the map. That was their stated objective. Nasser called Hussein, the, the, the leader of Jordan, on the telephone and said, the U.S. Sixth Fleet is bombing Cairo. That was a total lie. Would the Soviets support Syria? We didn't know. I arrived in the office about 7, 7.15, the telephone rings. And it says, this is General Smith. Prime Minister Kosygin's on the hotline, wants to talk to the president. What should I say? I said, why the hell do you call me? He said, the hotline ends in the Pentagon. I said, my God, I didn't even know that. Now, the hotline then, you know, was not a telephone. Today it is. Then it was a, a, a teletype. Our defense budget was about $40 billion. I said, look, take a few thousands of those dollars and patch this line over to the Situation Room in the White House, and I'll call the president, and we'll figure out what they'll say. 
I knew the president never awakened till eight o'clock or so. God damn it, Bob, it's 7.20 in the morning and you're awake. I said, Mr. President, Kasekin's on the line, the hotline, wants to talk to you. What should we say? He, What'd you say? He said, I said, Prime Minister Kasekin's on the hotline, wants to talk. He said, my God, what should, what should I tell him? So we get down to the Situation Room and there's an exchange of messages back and forth. But one of the messages said, Mr. President, if you want war, you'll get war. He thought incorrectly that we were preparing to support, or might be preparing to support Israel to attack Syria. The misunderstandings that developed, the tension that existed, the Cold War atmosphere, it was affecting uh, Moscow as well as, as Washington. I'm not a, by any means an authority on the Bible, but I love certain parts of it. The conversation between Job and God is fantastic. Job opens by giving God hell for dealing so adversely and unfairly with Job. And he demands that God change the relationship and advance Job's fortunes. And God, in effect, says to Job, look, son, pull up your socks and do it. He said, where were you when I created the world? You weren't doing a damn thing. You're not doing a damn thing now. Now, that's, that's in a sense, what I take out of these these lines and these, this conversation between Job and God. I just loved it because it, it, it epitomized for me what each human being should do. We're given certain talents. We're given certain capabilities. We're given certain opportunities. And we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to other human beings. And we owe it to God to make the most of those opportunities. There's no reason for complaint if you're not doing all you can do to help yourself. You do what you can do. And then you can complain to me if more is required. President Kennedy called the cabinet wives together and he said, you're all going to hate me. Your husbands and I are going to work so hard, you're never going to see them. But he said, I tell you what to do. Do your own thing. Whatever it is that brings you pleasure, a feeling, a contribution, accomplishment, do it. Well, Margaret had been a teacher before we were married, and she loved children, she loved teaching, she loved education, she believed in it. So she went into the Washington schools. She found that in the sixth grade, most of the children couldn't read. She said, you know, Bob, this is disgraceful. She said, I'm going to do something about it. She said, I'm going to offer them books, free books, and they can choose. Every student can select the book he wants, and it's his book. He can take it home with him. And after he reads that, if he wants to, he can select another book. My God, where are you going to get the money from? He said, don't you worry. Let me do this. She started what is known today as reading is fundamental. When Marg died 20 years ago, having started this by herself, she had 71,000 volunteers. She had been in Georgetown Hospital before Christmas, and I knew she was dying. And so I said to hell with them, I was gonna take her out of there and she's gonna die at home. She was in the house when I learned that Carter was gonna award her Medal of Freedom. Darling, this is the most wonderful thing that's happened, and I will go and I'll receive it for you and I'll come back and tell you everything. She said, I'm going. I said, my God, what do you mean you're going? She she was being fed intravenously. She had tape, tubes stuck all over her. She was taking, I think it was 120 cc's of Demerol a day, a drug that helped sedate her. She said, I'm going. I said, my God, you can't go. She said, I'm going. Sixteen days before Mark died, she received the Medal of Freedom. I so admired what she did. Many people have asked me why I didn't quit when it was so obvious that at times President Johnson and I had quite different views about what should be done in Vietnam. And my answer is that he was elected by the people of our country. I hadn't been elected. I felt an obligation to continue to help him achieve his objectives so long as he believed I could help. 
I think every American has an obligation to serve the president when he's asked to do so. I certainly felt I had, and I intended to fulfill it. When you talk about the responsibility for something like the Vietnam War, whose responsibility is it? It's the president's responsibility. I don't want to fail to recognize the tremendous contribution that I think Johnson made to the, to the country. I don't want to put the responsibility for Vietnam on his shoulders alone. But I do, I am inclined to believe that Kennedy had lived he would have made a difference. I don't think we would have had 500,000 men there. In the Bay of Pigs, you said to Kennedy that you wanted to come forward and take responsibility. Well, I, yes, I, because I wanted the public to know that, it, in my terms, the president was responsible. He made the final decision. But every single one of his executive branch advisors, every single one of the military advisors, every single one of the civilian advisors all recommended that he proceed with the Bay of Pigs operation, which was a total disaster. I thought the public should understand that this president wasn't totally irrational and totally irresponsible because the majority of people he, he had a right to lean on and seek advice from recommended he do it. But he said no. He said, I am responsible. Do you have similar feelings about Vietnam? Oh, of course, of course. You know, I've been asked, why is McNamara so forthcoming about World War II and so reticent about Vietnam? I just don't want to get into it. I'm not going to say any more about Vietnam, directly or indirectly. Let the people leave the movie and not know, and they can refer to history books and find out. I've written three books. The first was in retrospect, written in 1995, requiring that every person that buys a ticket to the movie buy a copy and show it when he enters. The second book, Argument Without End, is written to cover the meetings in Hanoi between U.S. military leaders and their counterparts from North Vietnam. The third book, Wilson's Ghost, Reducing the Risk of Conflict, Killing, and Catastrophe in the 21st Century. Wilson's dream was a dream of peace. He was saying to the American people, you must support me in my effort to encourage the Allies to come to a fair peace with Germany. And you must support me in my efforts to obtain U.S. support for the League of Nations. And neither objective was accomplished. What he foresaw then was World War II. He's speaking to the American people. You are betrayed. You fought for something you did not get. And the glories of the armies and navies of the United States is gone like a dream in the night. And there ensues upon it the nightmare of dread. And there will come some time in the vengeful providence of God, another war in which not a few hundred thousand will have to die, but many millions. That's what he feared and that's what happened. The hand that signed the paper fell to City. This is by Dylan Thomas. Five sovereign fingers taxed the breath, doubled the globe of dead and halved a country. Those five kings did a king to death. I love this line. The hand that signed the treaty bred a fever, and famine grew and locusts came. Great is the hand that holds dominion over man by a scribbled name. That's a particularly meaningful stanza to me.
The five kings count the dead, but do not soften the crusted wound or pat the brow. A hand rules pity as a hand rules heaven. Hands have no tears to flow.